That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. And the Oracle bowled in. That is out. Great theatre, magnificent drama. First match of the season, eh, huh? First match of the season, Martin. King Willow's on his throne and all is right with the world. Gods and flannelled fools. Um, <laughs> it's from a poem about cricket. Oh, very apt. How does it go on, my old Helen? That's the only line I know. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. You certainly made the point. Hello. And welcome to Gods and Flannelled Fools, episode three, The Great S.F. Barnes. This is the series in which I walk through a history of English Test Match cricket, focusing on key series, matches, players and teams of particular interest. So basically exploring the myths and legends of the game that collectively have really led to how we view Test Match cricket today. Um, if, if you haven't already listened, uh, I have a, a pilot episode uh, which covers a brief history of the game up to the very first two test matches in 1877. That's available, as well as both episodes one and two, in which I discuss firstly the birth of the Ashes in 1882, and then focus on the great Ashes series of 1902, culminating with Jessup's 100 at the Oval. So... Uh, worth checking those out on my channel. Uh, there is a Twitter profile for this series, at GFFpod. And I'll also make some notes uh, in support of uh, the various episodes on the blog, which is available on blogspot.com. Godsandflannelledfools.blogspot.com is the URL. So in this episode, I'm going to focus on one particular individual, a man by the name of Sidney Francis Barnes, who played 27 test matches for England between 1901 and 1914. And it's really the series against South Africa in 1913 to 14 that he's most famous for, and we'll get there. Um, but before I do, where are we at in, in this point in the, the evolution of test cricket? Well, the first test match took place back in 1877, the Ashes concept was created in 1882. Uh, in 1889, South Africa started playing tests. So they joined uh, England and Australia as the third test match playing nation. Although there's some controversy over the very first few test matches they played uh, and whether they were uh, or were not of first class standard. Um, if we take the Ashes series alone up to the outbreak of the Great War, there were uh, 22 series in all. Um, that's from 1882, the, the defence, the, the one that's the defence, uh, Australia's failed defence of the Ashes, I should say, being the first, uh, 1912 being the last. And England had won 15 of those and Australia only seven. Um, much of the dominance really uh, was in the first decade. And then since the turn of the century, it had been um, uh, much more evenly contested with, with great players competing on both sides. And I alluded to some of that in episode two. With South Africa emerging as a third test playing nation, this really changed the dynamic of test cricket. But as I say, their early efforts were fairly poor. Uh, they lost 10 of their first 11 tests uh, with just one draw there. But after uh, 1904, they really started to improve, and uh, two years later, they recorded their first win against England in 1906. And then this was then backed up when England toured there in 1909 to 1910. Um, they beat England in that series 3-2 before touring Australia and managing to win uh, one test there in an overall series defeat. So it's fair to say that Within two decades of starting, they'd, they'd sort of reached at least some sort of parity with the other two test-playing nations. Um, as I say, in episode two, I described the Edwardian pre-war period as the golden age for cricket, in which um, you know, the game was played in a carefree spirit with happy-go-lucky crowds and a, a sort of air of 
frivolity really in the performances. And there were a great many uh, you know, great names and characters throughout this time, but of course, many do not necessarily feature in the all-time records, um, partly down to the fact that the volume of matches were not what they were today, nowhere near, um, partly down to the logistics of undertaking a tour between really continents, if you think about it, the time involved to travel. Um, not all the players would, would you know, uh, go to every, every single tour. Um, but also the fact that these were amateur players. They didn't have a formal professional structure around them to dictate the number of games they needed to play like, uh, uh, like it is today. So the leading cricketers of the day might be selected for one series uh, and almost disappear from view, really, for the next one, um, as they had a life to be lived outside of the game. This, however, was soon to change. Cue the arrival of S.F. Barnes. That is very good. The swing works the Oracle again. So, Sid Barnes was born on the 19th of April, 1873, in Smethwick, in the Black Country. Uh, in those days, it was classed as Staffordshire, um, which was the county in which he would more or less spend his whole life. He was one of five children, and the only one who played cricket, and even his father didn't play. Um, as a young man in what was the late Victorian period, he learnt the art of calligraphy, um, that was his sort of profession, his skill, and he would later put this into practice as a, a very uh, talented inscriber of legal documents. Uh, eventually, in later life, he would actually present a handwritten scroll to uh, none other than Queen Elizabeth II. Um, Barnes started playing cricket for his local club uh, around the age of 15. Uh, he was taken under the wing of a man called Billy Bard, who was an ex-county bowler uh, who taught him off spin. Uh, he then taught himself the art of leg spin. Um, you have to remember this was still the relative early days of ball manipulation, as I talked about in, in the pilot. And to, to do that at, at this point in the evolution of, of uh, cricket, and particularly spin bowling, was, was quite remarkable. Um, and by 20, he was playing Birmingham League cricket. Um, it's interesting talking about Barnes in this way because um, Smethwick in the Black Country is not too far from, from where I, I live. Um, and the Birmingham League is a league that I've played cricket in um, you know, a few years ago now, but uh, it's a league I know quite well. Um, Barnes, by the, the age of 20, was, was really able to bowl quite quickly. Um, but, as I say, be able to, uh, to deliver most, most different styles of, of, uh, of delivery. Um, a year later, he was approached by Staffordshire County uh, Cricket Club. Uh, he turned them down as their pay was unattractive. Um, and this was something that would basically underpin his career and, and, in fact, his life. He was a man who was highly skilled in certain areas, not just cricket. He had a tremendous work ethic, but he did seek actively a reward for his talent and efforts and would not hesitate in turning the other way if his demands were not met. Um, so instead of joining them, he joined the ranks of Warwickshire for a short period of time um, before switching sides several times throughout the 1890s and then uh, spending quite a bit of time in the Lancashire leagues. Uh, in this period, he slowed down his bowling pace from out and out fast down to around about medium paced, but still attempting to spin the ball um, both ways at what would be considered a decent pace, particularly now. Um, sometimes he represented a county, um, but quite often his attitude was that he considered first class county cricket to be a great deal of hard work for relatively little money. Um, and the job security of his profession as an inscriber was really his main priority. Uh, he was invited to join the England squad in 1902 by Archie McLaren. Archie McLaren, of course, I talk about as being England captain in, in the last episode. Um, he ended up touring Australia, where he immediately took a fifer in Sydney um, and, in fact, took 19 wickets in his first two tests, although uh, a knee injury actually curtailed his participation. Um, McLaren, it was felted over, bowled him considerably. Um, and it was during this first series that 
that uh, Sid Barnes's personality really began to clash with the the more cavalier, happy-go-lucky attitudes of the uh, what you might call ex-public schoolers in the team. Um, and he was therefore only selected once on the Return Ashes series for the third match, the, the only match that took place at Bramall Lane. Again, that's a series that I discussed in, in episode two. Um, for the next couple of years, Barnes was, was in dispute with Lancashire, in fact. Again, partly down to pay, um, but also down to his uh, reoccurring knee injury. And this culminated in 1904 with him returning to league cricket with Staffordshire. And in fact, and this is remarkable, really, he would never play county championship cricket again. Um, his next test appearance wasn't until the 1907-08 Ashes, which really sort of indicates the... Uh, the sort of clash and the, and the spiky um, nature of his relationship with those in charge of England. Um, but in, in this series, he would take 24 wickets at an average of 26. And then again in 1909, uh, performed very well in the final three Ashes tests. Um, and that led to him being made Wisden Cricketer of the Year in 1910. Um, the following year, well, the, the 1911-12 to 12 Ashes series, he played all five tests taking 39 wickets and at times being described as, as more or less unplayable. Um, it's been, I think, retrospectively calculated by the ICC because, um, of course, it's only in the last couple of decades that they've run these, these sort of uh, statistical calculations that at this point in time he would have taken the number one spot in the test bowling rankings had that been in, in place. And he would have basically held the spot constantly for the next two years, all the way through to, uh, to the outbreak of the war. Now, at this point, um, before we continue, I've got a clip to share. As I said, for most of these episodes, I'm really going to try and get um, some, some clips put in. This time, it's not actually from Ben Travers, um, but some thoughts from Jeff Boycott on this really quite extraordinary bowler. Sidney Barnes, and many people will say, who the hell is he? Because he played quite a while ago. But Sidney Barnes is regarded by many people, many, many people, as probably the greatest bowler of all time. And people are going to say, really? I'll just read his statistics, because I, I think statistics are important to the point there's never been a great player with poor statistics. But I know that statistics don't tell everything. We've got to try and judge the players that we didn't see on what we read about the players that played against them, you know, and how strong the teams were, what conditions the pitchers were in. Sidney Barnes only played 27 tests against Australia and South Africa. He got 189 wickets at 16.43. Yeah, 16.43. Now, what did he bowl? He was a tall man with big hands, fingers. He bowled a kind of quickish cutter. If people remember Bill O'Reilly, he's probably a bit quicker than Bill O'Reilly, but he swung the ball in and then cut it away. Or did the other magic ball where he swung it out and cut it back. Now the Australian great players of the time, like Clem Hill, said he just bowled magic balls. And he was quite a character. He, uh, he went to us, uh, South Africa, played four test matches, got 40-some wickets in the series against South Africa, and he wouldn't play the fifth test match because he said that MCC, who ran English cricket then, had promised to pay for his wife, and they hadn't done so. And because they hadn't paid for her, he wasn't going to play. He could have got over 50-odd wickets in a series. He went to Australia. They bowled well in Australia against the, on the flat pitches against their very best batsmen, and there he... He played a match where he wasn't given the new ball by the captain and he was so miffed, he bowled, but he didn't bowl his best and he played hell about it. And the next test match the captain gave him the new ball, he bowled Australia out. So he's a fiery character. He wouldn't always play for uh, county cricket. He played a little bit for Lancashire, quite a bit for Warwickshire, but he didn't play all the time. He refused to play county cricket all the time because he could make more money bowling in the leagues or playing for Staffordshire in the minor counties. And his overall record in every minor counties match, that second team, first team, first class cricket, test cricket, everything he ever played, he got a wicket for about six runs. 
It's unbelievable, isn't it? So, Jeff Boycott there with the thoughts on uh, Sid Barnes, his character and also his bowling style. Um, and you can only imagine from the contemporary descriptions of, of uh, how he bowled as being absolutely horrendous to face. Um, when interviewed as a 90-year-old uh, in the 1960s, um, so he was a very old man at this point, the question was put to him, did you cut the ball like Derek Underwood? And his response was, cut it. He then glared and said, I spun the ball. And... Um, yeah, you can just imagine with these huge hands bowling at, you know, probably more the medium pace, but applying spin, as, as Boycott just described it then. Um, he mentioned the South Africa tour, and that's what we'll talk about next. Um, so in, in 1913 to 14, Barnes toured South Africa with the MCC, and as you heard there, played four out of five tests. Um, as I say, he didn't play in the final test, apparently because they wouldn't pay for his wife's accommodation. Uh, the way that that tour panned out was that the first test was a resounding innings defeat uh, with South Africa collapsing twice and Barnes took two fifers. Uh, the second test was almost just as convincing at the Wanderers in Johannesburg. And here, uh, Barnes actually became the first bowler to take more than 15 wickets in a test match, finishing with figures of eight for 56 and uh, nine for 103 in the second innings. And I gave him a match analysis of 17 for 159. Uh, he took another five for in the third test and then two seven-wicket hauls in the fourth. Um, South Africa actually managed to salvage a draw in the fourth and, as I say, he didn't play in the fifth. So he finished the series with a, an extraordinary 49 wickets. Um, who knows what it would have been had he played all five, and that helped England to a 4-0 test series victory. Um, and that would actually be the final series of tests he would ever play. Um, when thinking of, of, of numbers, I think, of, of this sort of level, um, a cricket fan would immediately think, uh, come to mind of, of Jim Laker's famous match analysis in 1956 where he, he took uh, 19 for 90, took 19 out of the 20 wickets in the match. Um, that, of course, will, <laughs> will be something we'll feature in a, in a future episode. Um, by all accounts, during that game, Don Bradman actually records seeing Barnes, uh, that was at the Old Trafford test, uh, after Laker had basically destroyed Australia, and uh, turned round to him and said, well, what do you think of that? Um, Barnes sort of turned round, shrugged, and, and gruffly replied, well, no bugger ever got 10 when I was at the other end, which um, seems to be a reference to the fact that Laker's... Uh, co-bowler, the bowler at the other end, which was Tony Locke, didn't take a wicket in the second innings. Um, in the whole match, he took one for 106 in 69 overs. So he, as well as having this talent, he was obviously um, very, very self-assured as well. Um, when you look at, at Sid Barnes' test stats, he took, as Boycott says, 189 test wickets from 27 tests. Um, his average of 16.43 and his strike rate of 41 are pretty much the lowest among bowlers who have, uh, well, they are completely the lowest among bowlers who have played in more than 25 tests and taken more than 150 wickets. Um, he took his 150th test match wicket in only his 24th test, which is still a world record. Um, the next best, I think, are Waka Yunus and Yazir Shah, who took uh, 27 tests each. And the Orca bowled in. That is out. Great theatre. Magnificent drama. So we have a number of descriptions of Barnes from his contemporaries. Um, the great Australian batsman Clem Hill said that on a perfect wicket, Barnes could swing the new ball in and out very late. Um, he could spin it, uh, pitch it on the le leg stump uh, and miss the off. Uh, so kind of Shane Warne levels of, of turn um, and, and really described his ability to deploy full variety in the space of just a single over. Um, he also remarked on Barnes's creativity as being one of the first bowlers really to use the seam of a new ball and combine swing um, with spin and, and do it in a way that few batsmen could really distinguish one from the other. Um, as I said before, his teammates all testified to the fact that he was not an easy man to handle on the field. 
because there was a, a devilish aspect about him. Um, in, in so much as, unlike the amateurs, he didn't play cricket out of any sort of starry-eyed idealism. Um, for Sid Barnes, his talents came with a price tag. Um, Neville Cardus described Barnes' uh, splendid upright action, right arm straight over. And in fact, with some photos that we can see, um, it, it really shows that he had this. Um, he ran on easy strides, which was perhaps a, a reference to the fact that he started out as quite a fast bowler. So I think bowling within himself was, a, uh, was obviously a talent that he developed. Uh, Wilfred Rhodes uh, recalled that Barnes carried the ball in his left hand until a few strides from delivery he, he switched it to the right, which is something that James Anderson sort of does now in terms of shielding the ball from the view of the batsman as he approaches. Uh, Cardus also said that Barnes was a, was a hostile attacking bowler who also made the batsman play the ball, um, not necessarily in terms of pace, but... Um, Barnes actually said himself about later bowlers um, sending down so many balls that the batsman needn't play. Uh, in his words, I never gave him any rest. Um, so he was a relentless bowler. Um, apparently, he mellowed a little bit in, in retirement, but uh, you can't really imagine a spinner these days being described as hostile. It's a, it's a fantastic, scary combination. Um, in terms of his build... Um, Barnes was described as more than six feet tall uh, and he maintained quite an erect posture with wide shoulders, a deep chest, long arms, strong legs. In John Arlott's view, he was perfectly built to be a bowler um, and he also regarded him as more than medium pace, perhaps even fast medium. Uh, he would conceal and change his pace. He could produce deliveries that were uh, faster and slower than his usual pace so so batsman I mean uh, as a batsman myself um, judging the the pace was probably one of the hardest things to do particularly on a two pace wicket so for a bowler to be able to change that uh, was uh, you know was quite worrying really um, he could bowl a, a very effective Yorker um, in his area in his area in his era I should say the um, the same ball would basically be used for the whole of a, of a team's innings with, with no new ball like there is now. So um, that had to be taken into account. Um, and it was also written of his bowling that, um, he, and I think Boycott said this actually in the clip, that even in the finest weather and on the, the truest wickets in Australia, um, he could carry on with all his variations. Um, and the most deadly of all the balls he would deliver... Uh, was the one that he delivered from wide on the crease um, that moved in with late swerve, uh, basically the width of the wicket, and then straightened back off the ground to hit the off stump. Um, really devastating delivery. That is very good. The swing works, the Oracle again. Sid Barnes was 41 years old when the First World War began, and at the time he was too old for military service. Um, naturally, first-class cricket was shelved for the duration of the war, but league cricket continued, and there were numerous top-class players, including Jack Hobbs and Wilfred Rhodes and Frank Woolley, who signed up to play in the Bradford League. Um, Barnes saw an advert placed by... Saltair Cricket Club, um, and, uh, and applied for the role apparently by saying, will I do? Um, and between 1915 and 1923, um, he played exclusively um, with actually a, a great deal of success for that club. Uh, they won the league three times uh, whilst Barnes played for them. Um, and in fact, on his debut in 1915, he took eight for eight um, and followed that with all 10 for 14 against another club, uh, including five wickets in five successive balls. Um, and in later seasons, there, there were more examples of taking all 10 against uh, several teams. Uh, you know, as, as before the war, uh, Barnes was well aware of his value to, uh, to Solterre and characteristically drove a hard bargain. Um, there were several records of, uh, of, of sellout record crowds being in attendance and gate receipt matches when he was playing. And 
In fact, in 1916, his match fee doubled and increased further in 1922. Um, like all professionals operating in league cricket, he benefited from the, a sort of past-the-hat crowd collection, which um, uh, partly performance rewards, but almost sort of uh, a precursor to the whole benefit um, uh, scene that's happened in, in county crickets in the last few decades. Um, it really served as a supplement. Um, and indeed, he, he subsequently secured a coaching role at Bradford Grammar School, which is near Saltaire. Um, that club actually overreached themselves to play for, for Barnes, and it took an effort to rebalance the books. So uh, he, he certainly managed to get his his uh, his own perception of his of his worth in pound notes. Um, I mean, you could almost liken his his sort of post uh, or rather uh, during war and post war cricket as uh, as like someone like Virat Kohli today quitting international cricket and and basically hopping around the globe, turning out for any team who paid him the highest price. Um, even in today's multi-format market. Um, so, yes, that, that was Barnes the cricketer. Um, actually, 15 years after Barnes left Saltaire, they signed the young Jim Laker. He was then a 16-year-old schoolboy. Uh, and he played for that club through um, uh, the late 1930s to, to the outbreak of World War II, uh, joined the British Army and, um, uh, and didn't actually develop his off-break uh, bowling until he joined the army. Um, until that point, he was really just a promising batsman. Um, and it was when he was a 10 year coaching class with Yorkshire uh, that he listened to a conversation with uh, George Hurst and Herbert Suchcliffe. They didn't often agree with each other by all accounts, but Laker remembered Suchcliffe being in such agreement with Hurst's view that Sidney Barnes was the greatest bowler there's ever been, and what's more, the greatest bowler there ever will be. Um, and uh, even then, Laker had watched Barnes in, in his 60s in a, in a league match and said that his control of the ball was absolutely remarkable. Um, in fact, after Laker became an England bowler, uh, he was able to meet Barnes and remembered one particular conversation, uh, I think it was at Lord's. Um, Laker was impressed by Barnes's genuine enthusiasm and confidence, which he still had at that age. Um, and had been told that Barnes would bowl, you know, a real variety of deliveries, um, you know, an in-swinger, fast off-break, leg cutter, all in the same over. He asked Barnes if this was true, and Barnes said, keep trying something different. And, um, of course, he heeded that advice, and we'll touch upon that in a later episode. Um, in later life... So when he did actually step away for, from playing cricket, uh, Barnes became very close friends with uh, Plum Warner, uh, a contemporary you might remember from those pre-war years, uh, the golden age of cricket. And they grew old watching cricket together at, um, at Lords, particularly. Um, Sid Barnes eventually died in 1967 at his home in Cannock in Staffordshire. Um, as I mentioned earlier, even undertaking inscription jobs well into his, his 90s. Um, so let's take a, a, a final look at his stats then. So um, in test matches, uh, he took 189 wickets at an average of 16.43. Um, if you then break down county cricket, um, as Boycott said, sort of other first-class matches, Staffordshire, league and club cricket, and you put all of those things together, his uh, average was actually 8.33. <laughs> um, he took over 6,000 wickets. Um, for league and club combined, his average was as low as six. I mean, it's it, it's extraordinary, really. It's it's unlikely that they'll ever be bettered. Um, so, yeah, the great SF Barnes. Um, and that really concludes this episode of Gods and Flannelled Fools. The, the last one, really, where we talk about uh, events prior to the Great War, which, of course really decimated the country and the male population. Um, you know, it obviously tossed aside trivial matters such as sport. Um, but in the next episode, I'm going to take a look at the side England put together in the post-World War I years, um, with a particular focus on the great batsmen, including Hobbs and Suchcliffe. Until then, thanks for listening. <laughs>